Hi, I'm Tony Nichols and welcome to Chamber Chat. Welcome to Chamber Chat, a program put together by the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce to keep you informed on what's going on in your chamber and in your community. Joining us today on Chamber Chat, a first-time guest, I yeah. believe, Brick Briggs, the Chief Academic Officer for Wacomico County Public Schools. You got it right. Welcome to the program, man. It's great to be here. All right, so let's do this right up. I, I've never heard of a Chief Academic Officer, so you, you, you have to help the, right. the people, the, the Chamber Chat audience. All right, I'll see what I can do. So we have a uh, superintendent, Dr. Donna Hanlon, who sure. oversees the entire district, uh -huh. um, and she has three assistant superintendents. Um, who assist her um, in, okay. in, in leading the district, and I am one of those. Um, so traditionally, it was just called an assistant superintendent position, um, okay. and she's kind of renamed it to focus on uh, the academic aspect of it. So, okay. Um, so it's not a new position. Not it's a new just, position. Just um, uh, spruced it up. That's it. The title. And I'm proud to be the first one. Okay, right? yeah. that, you're the inaugural one. I am. So tell us what uh, your position entails. All right, so I oversee everything instructionally in the entire district for pre-K all the way through 12th grade. Um, so um, in addition to that, I also have the instructional, uh, excuse me, the uh, technology department okay. um, under us. So um, that's a vital part of running a, a large school district like we have. Um, I get to work with a great team of instructional supervisors, directors, and principals to make sure that our students are having the best instruction possible. Um, and that they're implementing instructional programs throughout you know, the elementary, middle, and secondary levels um, to meet the needs of all our kids. Uh, we examine the, the current um, practices that are going on um, and see what tweaks need to be made for, made for those, um, as well as explore other opportunities outside um, the district that we could possibly bring in um, to help meet the needs of our kids. I know, you know Dr. Hanlon has presented herself as very hands-on, wanting to, you know, change what needs to be changed but then if, if it's working not just leave it alone but try to make it better kind of uh, thing but so I was going to ask and and looking at the instructional aspect okay. uh, of the classrooms and, and getting do you get feedback from the teachers do you guys meet and how, what what kind of information will flow does that look yeah, like? Yeah so um, I have two directors two, two of the directors that work um, alongside me um, I have a director of secondary ed and a director of elementary ed um, and so they work hand in hand with the principals um, to who are then working with their teachers every day. Now, I think it's critically important. Um, I'm coming straight from a principal's position, and it was the best job in the world, um, in the school every day, in the classrooms, in the hallways, and, and working with the teachers and the kids. Um, and in my new role, I still think it's critically important to be in the schools, um, to be walking side by side with the principals, to being in the classrooms, to seeing what's going on. Um, I also think it's important to get feedback from both parents and students. Mm. Um, as a parent in the community, um, uh, I think it's important to, to be sitting in the stands at soccer games and listening to the parents and hearing what's going on. Um, I also think it's important to be um, talking with the kids in the, in the hallways, um, figuring out, hey, what's going on that you like, what's going on that you don't like. Right. Um, and so um, we can work together to make this the best district possible. Yeah, you know, and it's like, I, I, re I liken it to a, a cop on the beat. You know, you get out there and people get familiar with you, people get comfortable with you, yeah. then people will begin to share things with you. That's correct. Um, actually, you know, I, I got a phone call yesterday from uh, a parent who's um, let me know some things that weren't going so well. Mm -hmm. um, and yesterday she called me to let me know um, two things that were just absolutely wonderful. That's cool. Um, she was praising um, her youngest child's teacher who is new to the profession and is doing an absolute great job. Um, and she was also letting me know about um, her other student who's in middle school and how um, they were a little bit worried about the middle school experience because that can be some trying years, uh -huh. um, but he's, he's off to a great start. <laughs> you, you, uh, so you uh, have plausible deniability, so you can't <laughs> agree or disagree with this statement, but 
middle school, that, you know, you might you might just find the meanest people on the planet there. It is, uh, it's a tough year. That's 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 a tough few years there. Uh, I was I actually served for two years as a middle school solely middle school principal, and then five years as Bless a principal you. of a middle and high yeah. school. Um, and now my daughter has just entered sixth grade, so now <laughs> I'm getting to experience it from the, the parents' perspective. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping to, as a parent, I'm hoping to survive. Uh, yeah. but she's also most a great get time. through without any problem. But that, that's uh, I, I remember for me, I was I was. Awkward times yep. at, uh, at points. So you're you're not new to the school system. So you were you were. Uh, how long have you been to the school system? You're a principal. Um, this obviously. is my nineteenth year. Nineteenth year. All in Wacomico County. Wow. Okay. Um, before uh, actually, I, was, uh, I came through the system. Willard's Elementary, Pittsville Middle School, Parkside High School. Okay. Um, didn't even leave for college. Actually, came right over here to SU. Um, I was a math major. Um, uh, graduated. Took you, a have, little, you have been out of the state. I um, occasionally, <laughs> just not for career-wise. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, yeah, so I started teaching at Waha. Taught math. Um, I, in addition to teaching, um, probably one of the reasons I went into education was actually the coaching aspect. Okay. Uh, I wanted to coach soccer, like Coach Hall at Parkside, who was my soccer coach. Um, so I got to coach soccer, basketball, and baseball. Um, and those, the the relationships that you build with with young student athletes. Um, is just simply awesome, um, and I definitely value, or benefited from that. I've uh, told many people over the years that I learned as much on an athletic field, yep. uh, pro more on an athletic field about life mm -hmm. than I did, uh, you know, in a classroom. Because the interaction, the team play, the the, the people depending upon you, the you know um, responsibility of um, you know. It's it's my fault. Yep. It's not anyone else's fault. Not a victim mentality. There, right. There's so many things that that I learned on a football field. I agree, and I think it's important that we try to get um, our students involved in as many extracurricular activities as possible. Um, so it's beyond the school day. Yes, the the 7:45 to 2:45 is critically important, um, but it's also important that we engage them in things after school. Right. And while sports aren't for everybody, whether it's, it could be the performing arts, it could be drama. Um, different clubs, Lego club, we got you know, engineering programs and stuff. So providing students the opportunity to, to participate in things after school is also important. Yeah, my kids were um, not athletes. I was, mm -hmm. I played everything. Right. Uh, and, but I didn't have kids that wanted to play sports in school, but they were plugged into other things. It. And it's, it was, I agree, it was pretty vi vital to um, their growth in the school. And there's tons of research out there. Students who are involved in school um, beyond the school day, those are kids who do well, right? Uh, they're the ones who are graduating on time. Those are the ones who are going off to college um, mm -hmm. and doing good things. So um, we sh we're trying to expand some of those current opportunities um, as well. We have some good programs now, but we're trying to um, look into expand as, as, whenever possible. All right, Brick, I'm gonna put you on the spot, brother. You got it. Dr. Hanlon has three strategic priorities. Now we can cut this segment out <laughs> if if you don't know these priorities. No, I got it. I got it. But could you tell us what those are? Sure, sure. So there's three this year um, that will probably extend into the next several years. But one's focusing on the early learners. Two is focusing on our graduates, and then three is that critical workforce that we have um, to help students succeed um, the whole way through. So the first one is a focus on early literacy. Um, mm -hmm. We need students reading on grade level by third grade. Yeah. Um, there's, again, research states that any student who's not reading on grade level by third grade is four times more likely to drop out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, and taking from a student who's coming from a low-income family, um, that increases to six times more likely. So it's critically important that we get students reading on grade level by third grade. Those uh, same statistics tie into crime, jail, they do. Yeah, the, they do. Yeah, they do. Very we, same statistics. That's too. correct. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways we're focusing on that is by focusing on um, kindergarten readiness. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually a kindergarten readiness assessment um, that came out of Johns Hopkins um, that students take in their beginning of kindergarten that show how academically ready they are for school. Um, in this past year, only 33% of our students um, demonstrated ready, readiness. Um, gotcha. And that's, so they're coming in deficient and it's so hard to catch up. So a couple ways which we're going to go about trying to work on that, um, trying to expand our pre-K opportunities. Right now, not all of our students in Micomico County have access to pre-K. So we're looking to expand those opportunities um, as well as work with community partners um, such as the chamber um, to um, uh, 
get information out there to assist parents um, in understanding what it means to be ready for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I think information is key. If, if people just know, yep. so much stuff is available, uh, so many programs are available. That's correct. That, that if we can just get the word to, you know, X number of more parents, that I, I, I don't see them not engaging and not getting their children involved. Right. They, they want what's best for their sure. kids. Um, and if somebody said, hey, Rick, what can, what's the one thing they could read to your children, yeah. <laughs> read to your kids, get put books, get books in their house. You know, Christmas mm -hmm. is coming up. I'm not sure when this segment where, but uh, anything you can do for, uh, for young kids, it, it, buy them a book and read right. to them and, right. and take the time. So that was number one. Uh, the second uh, major emphasis is focusing on the college and career readiness. Um, we need students graduating from our school system, um, ready to be productive members of society. Um, in 2016, our graduation rate was only 82%. Mm -hmm. um, that's not acceptable. Sure. Um, it's not good. Um, we need students graduating either ready to go on to college, whether it's two or four year, or marketable skills, um, ready to be productive members and, and contribute in the workforce. Sure. Um, so that's the second one. And then the third one is the um, recruitment and retention of a high performing workforce. We need the best and the brightest working with our kids. Agreed. Um, unfortunately, we've had a lot of turnover recently. Um, that coupled with the teacher shortage that's affecting not only Wicomico County, but the state of Maryland and the entire nation. Um, so we're really focused on um, recruiting and retaining a high quality workforce. Um, recently, we had our first Wicomico County teacher recruitment fair. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually having another one in the spring, hoping to capture um, the next you know, crop of teachers who want to come to and, and join one of the best districts around. I, I agree with that, uh, 100%. Uh, the, the recruiting a high quality workforce that, that dovetails into in working with many, many, many business owners in the area and serving on boards that plug into the workforce development aspect of things. That, that bleeds not only from the school, but it bleeds, it bleeds directly into the workforce of the employers here in Wicomico County. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and we're looking to strengthen that. We have a strong working relationship, um, like our CTE program, Career and Technology Education, so they have a lot of internships. We look, we're hoping to expand some of those opportunities. Um, we also have some students who, you know, high school, you know, they're 17, 18. The traditional school day is not necessarily for them. Sure. Um, and so we're looking at um, trying to figure out ways to get them, you know, maybe some career internships, getting them a job while also working to earn their diploma. Um, that's critically important. We're also working with both, you know, Warwick, SU. We have some great right. um, relationships there through dual enrollment, um, teacher development. Um, so we have some good programs, but we want to continue over the next couple of years uh, to expand and, and um, better meet the needs of our kids. Okay, so you told me you were 19 years in. Yep. We can break it right here on Chamber Chat. Are you 20 and done? Or no. Are you gonna? No. You gonna You're, keep on? I, I am through? fully invested into Wicomico County Public Schools and, and okay. look forward to serving in whatever capacity Dr. Hanlon sees fit and whatever she needs uh, for the next several years. Um, uh, this is, I'm six months into this position, and there I look go. forward to doing it for a long time to come. Um, and, you know, looking forward, to, just this past Friday, collaborating with other assistant superintendents around the state. Um, I spent some time this past um, Friday, you know, working with an assistant superintendent from Anne Arundel County who was able to share about some of the, these signature programs that they're running through their um, middle and high schools where students are able to tack into like specific areas of interest. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about those middle school years. Oh, yeah. It's a tough year, yeah, it um, but to better engage them in um, some area of interest, whether it's the fine arts, whether it's STEM education, sure. whether it's athletics. Yeah. We have so many kids who just want to play sports. Well, maybe we can tie that into their educational experience to, to, to better meet their needs. Very cool. Well, Brick, it's, uh, it's good to hear. We get to keep people like you in the school systems and maybe another 20 years from now you might think about the retirement, but we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll keep you as long as Sounds we Sounds good. You. I appreciate Thanks that. Thanks for joining us on Chamber Chat. Thank you. We'd like to give you an opportunity now to take a look at the upcoming events with the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back to Chamber Chat right here on Pack 14. 
Joining us now is a guy that most people in the area know, Mr. Chris Eccleston, this time joining us on PAC 14 as chair-elect for yeah. the Board of Directors for the Chamber of Commerce. Thanks. Welcome back, man. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So, um, chair-elect with the, with the Board of Directors of the Chamber of Commerce. So, before we get to that, Give us a little insight in terms of uh, who's Chris Eccleston? I mean, he's a come here, from here. Yeah, from here. So born and raised, mm -hmm. uh, proud, um, uh, you know, been on Delmarva my whole life with the exception of about seven, eight years. Um, and then, uh, you know, just a big uh, service to the community person. I want to mm -hmm. be a part of um, uh, the community. I want... Um, my kids to experience and my family to experience what I had growing mm -hmm. up and this is this is a great place to um, raise a family and be a part of the community that we have a community like no other place I've been 100% and right. um, you know I think the chamber is a big part of that mm -hmm. so yeah I agree so you, you've got a brand there on your shirt uh, that's uh, pretty recognizable nowadays um, tell us a little bit about how your company came to be um, and um, and where you see it going? So, uh, Delmarva Veteran Builders is a company we started um, five, five years ago, actually in January. January will be our five year anniversary, which is unbelievable and incredible all at the same time. So, they say the first five years of business is the hardest. So, we've, right. we've made the hump. But, uh, you know, it was, um, it was a vision um, and a, a thought process that correlates with uh, the military. You know, mm -hmm. the teamwork, the, the attitude, and that drive um, and that kind of goal-oriented mentality. So the military has that. They have the, um, the, um, the ability to go into uh, a mission, a battle plan, whatever, and they're going to win. They don't. They, they, not, you, they can't fail. Right. right. So we've taken that attitude to the, to the construction industry right here on Delmarva, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it's just been incredible. I think our timing to the, to the market we got lucky with. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, people, um, our team and the community has just kind of rallied behind us. It's been absolutely amazing to watch. I mean, I, I, unbelievable. So we just recently had uh, the economic forecast mm -hmm. with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and the member Derricker presented uh, results from surveys. I'm sure you got a copy of the yeah. survey. I got a copy of the survey to, to participate. Uh, but it was, uh, for the first time ever, an overwhelming positive outlook yeah um, from the commercial construction side of things from your vantage point what are you seeing in the commercial construction world <clears throat> I, I think it's uh, I think it's on I don't want to say quite red hot but it's it's approaching the red hot uh, kind of mm -hmm. um, scenario yeah. uh, this is the first time in my professional career going to one of the economic forecasts in, in 10 years where I can honestly say everybody's like, I'm excited. I'm looking forward right. to, uh, you know, 2018 and 2019. And I heard that across the room from a lot of different industries. I think one of the things um, that the De um, Delmarva and construction industry as a whole is, is going to deal with is, is the labor shortage. There's just not enough jobs. Um, right now and not, not enough human capital to perform the work that mm. the demand of work that's out there. I also think that uh, this area now because of leadership in the community um, with certain political uh, leaders and just the overall sense of the community that we have now that is encouraging for outsiders and I think more people are starting to see that from a larger scale right. and I think that's also um, driving the construction um, you know in the overall marketplace so people are excited they're they're proud to be here it's attracting attention from other locations and i think you know on the next five to ten years they're pretty exciting here i want to put you on the couch and give you a crystal ball for a minute and uh, how do you so for the next five or ten years you that you foresee the economy is going to be the economy mm -hmm. um but given the, it was a perfect tie given the the current leadership um that, that's in place, the vision that they have for the community. You see this uh, economic development boom, if you will, continuing? I, I do. I think the Sussex County area is going to just continue to, mm -hmm. to, to grow. I think you're going to see that um, 
grow all the way up probably into Dover uh, in, in 10 years. I think you're going to see it grow west out to 113 and Route 1 all the way. Mm -hmm. um, that Mil it, is it Milford now that's uh, pretty hot right now? Milford yeah. is building a brand new hospital. Uh -huh. um, you know, so I, I, I really believe that you're going to see um, more influx of people into that area and they're going to start hearing and seeing um, Salisbury and the Lower Shore and our treasures and, and our community and I think people are going to want to be a part of that. And The more exposure we get and I think uh, next year on the national horizon with the National Folk Festival that's yeah. just a whole another opportunity. Yeah, so so I, I really believe the next five to ten years here are going to be a bright bright future. So you're moving from chair elect to chair of the board for the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. Why did you get involved in the chamber? Uh, I, again, I believed in um, what the chamber represents. So it represents to me um, that advocacy piece to the business community and the membership at large. And it's, you know, and, the, and I would say caveat with that, the economic development piece of that. And that's really important to me. Um, it was a, a way to, to, to get in, so serve my community, and um, you know, be a, be, a, be a part of it. So that's why I, that's what attracted me to the chamber. I've been probably involved now for five, seven years maybe. I can't, re I can't remember when I started, but it's been quite a long time. Yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, I remember you're, you're, for many years you were part of the business and economic development mm -hmm. uh, adv uh, and adv advocacy as well, um, even chairing that division at one point. Uh, so I've, I've, you know, I've been involved. Um, having being um, past chair of the board and mm -hmm. um, um, not removing myself from the chamber. Obviously, chamber chat's still here. <laughs> um, but it, you're, you're less involved in the almost day-to-day. -day. Sure. I've, I've seen you. I've been in countless meetings where, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sitting across the table and I have to look at Chris Eccleston. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, one, one thing that I think Bill has, has really adopted, and I, I think uh, political leadership's more adopting and just people in a general sense are more adopting is that this regional economic development is really just an, uh, a powerful engine and I think that's maybe uh, something that um, people are, 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 are realizing and um, so we Bill led the charge and we hosted a, uh, um, a, a Del Marva wide uh, chamber mm -hmm. mixer a couple months ago and, and people are starting to, to see that, and I think one of the new things that they're talking about and that we're working towards, and Bill's kind of taking the leadership here, is to get all three governors in a room on Delmarva, wow. Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and start talking about how we all win as Delmarva, because I, I've been an advocate for a long time. On Delmarva, we view ourselves as the mid-shore, lower shore, upper shore, Delaware, Maryland, you know, but when you get across the bridge, everybody just looks at us as Delmarva. Sure. So if we sure. can adopt that mentality and know that if something, a big fish lands in Delaware or a big fish lands in, in Virginia or Maryland, um, we all win because of that. That's true. Uh, so that to me is the future of economic development. It's no longer, the county lines don't mean anything as far as economic. We're in a digital age now, um, the county line, you know the borders, if you will. That was a horse, horse, uh, one horse uh, back ride day away from the county seat. Right. I mean that that doesn't mean anything today. So I mean we have to start kind of thinking more collaboratively uh, on Delmarva. As things change over the course of uh, years, uh, the chamber is approaching 98 years old. Yeah. Uh, we you know <laughs> we're getting the, the chamber is getting ready to be 100 years old. Are there any, is there anything in the works? Has the planning started? Because, you know, um, to use some vernacular from North Carolina, we need to have a shindig. <laughs> um, or is, are there any plans being put in place now? Yeah, absolutely. So it's one of the big things on my radar for this year, and I've been, you know, beating the drum about it for uh, all this year. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to do is identify uh, kind of maybe a chairperson um, to, to host the 100 year committee so 2020 it's t two years away we're going to get um start getting funds in place and start gearing up for something big um you know so if people want to get involved in that and be you know we're going to lean on past presidents as well mm -hmm. um and form a committee and and really so i think that is going to be one of the major goals of uh, the, the 2018 year that we um, 
get the, the foundation built for that and start moving forward and identifying what those plans are. I, kn I do know that the chamber, you know, has some building issues that um, need to be addressed, and so maybe we tie this 100-year um, anniversary with a capital campaign. There's yep. been some discussion about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it also fits in. Uh, Purdue will be having their 100-year anniversary the same year. Right. So uh, a lot of things. I think the Lions Club um, and maybe the one of the Rotaries is also all in the same time okay. frame. So it's you know it's really exciting to be uh, to see all these different things uh, approaching 100 years. So yeah, it's uh, it's going to be awesome to be involved in that. Um, the chamber has always had symbiotic and and very good relationships with the Greater Salisbury Committee, SWED, um, all of the certainly all of the local elected leaders, but um, state elected leaders. But of late. Um, as of a couple of years ago, uh, yeah. not just now, but of late, it's even getting better um, and more cohesive. Is I, is that a, is that intentional? I I, I 100% agree with you. I, I don't think I've ever seen it as strong as it is mm -hmm. today. And I think Ernie laid that groundwork, sure. and I think Bill's built on that as well as Mike Dunn and mm -hmm. Dave Ryan. And I, <clears throat> it kind of goes back to that collaborative strategy I was talking about for Delmarva. I yep. think the Lower Shore has recognized that to be collaborative and to move in um, kind of a unanimous, you know, uh, agreement. I mean, people aren't always going to agree, but when you have a outside entity come to this area and every single person is excited, and, and you see a chamber or a Greater Salisbury and a Swed working together you know, excited about the future. I mean, that's that's pretty attractive from okay. uh, from an outsider or just people that are, you know, com you know, community minded people. The investors here locally. I mean, they're they're getting excited, sure. you know, because there's th there's just a opportunity here, and, and pe people are people are excited about it. I I know I am. Uh, I, there's a lot of people that would get on that bandwagon. Me being one of them. So in the in the next year, you know, um, all eyes are on Chris. Um, you're, you're the, you're the big idea guy. I mean, there's any room that, that you're in, you know, I don't, I don't think people expect you to, to bring the big idea, but many times you, you do. <laughs> so what do, what do we see in the next year? Uh, what, where's a, what, let's get a peek into a, a year from now. What are we talking about? <clears throat> well, there, um, we, I spoke about the hundred year anniversary. So I think that's really important. Um, I think to the to, to me personally, and I think it also is really important to a lot of chamber members mm -hmm. um, to see the chamber reach that 100-year milestone and to uh, have a, a good foundation and plan in place. So, so that is um, one thing that I'm going to be really focused on. I think the other thing, too, is uh, um, the work uh, between that collaborative effort to maintain that and just kind of build on that. Um, and I, I think the other piece, too, is I've become, since I've become, have become a father recently, I've realized how um, important public education is to the economic engine okay. of Delmarva mm -hmm. and the Lower Shore. And I think that's one thing that we've probably lost a little bit of um, sight on. And mm -hmm. I think the time now is, is, is now. We have a great new superintendent. Absolutely. She has a wonderful vision. Um, we have to look at public education as an investment. Um, we look at infrastructure as an investment for economic development, but this community has never really looked at public education as an investment for economic development. So I think that's a conversation that I'm going to start trying to bring up, and, and, and I have been for, for months talking about that, and that's really important. I mean, as a, as a business person and a community person, if, if there's a lot of opportunity here in the next 10 years, we're going to wake up 10 years from now, realize that we're going to miss out on a lot of opportunity. Right, we'll, because we'll we're, be in a good spot yeah. or in a bad spot. Right. Yeah. So, and I kind of run the parallel. I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of being able to go look at some schools in, the, in, the, in Delaware, our neighbors, 30 minutes from here. And these schools are, well, the technology in place, what their, their curriculums and stuff like mm -hmm. that, no discount to what we're doing here as a public school, but we're just not on right. the same level as in, as far as investment. And to me, that that'll catch up with us. Right. And I, I've heard business 
leaders now in rooms in the greater Salisbury, you've heard them as well, yeah. and, and the chamber say, well, if I have uh, student A and student B and, and this student 30 minutes from here, you know, that's where I'm going to hire. Sure. So I think that's something that we have to start really, really honing in on. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a conversation. Yeah, I, sure. I don't know right. that I'm, I have the right answer, but I think it's a conversation that the community really, really has to start having. Yeah, well, so before we wrap up, you have to make me a promise. <laughs> Maybe halfway through your tenure as uh, chair of the board, you come back and give us an update. Absolutely. Maybe give us a little more insight on us how that hundred year, yeah, that hundred year celebration is going to be. Well, I think the I think the chamber. One other thing I, I kind of forgot to mention is that the the, the folk festival is coming here, and I, I I'm going to push, and I know Bill's pushing that the chamber is instrumental oh, yeah. in, in involved in that. And so I think that there's an opportunity to have maybe a gala associated with that or kind of the kickoff, um, yeah. if you will, to, to that event. And, and so that's, that's something that's kind of on the radar as well. Cool. So, but absolutely, I'd love to come back and, right. and, and give an update. Put it in the calendar. Right, Chris Eccleston, Chair-elect, Salt right. Area Chamber of Commerce. Thanks thank for you for joining me. us, man. Thank you. We'd like to thank you as well for joining us on this edition of Chamber Chat. Um, and if you've missed any portion of this program or you'd like to view previous editions of Chamber Chat, we encourage you to utilize PAT14's website on demand function or visit the Chamber's website. That's all the time we have for this edition of Chamber Chat. My name's Tony Nichols, your host, encouraging you to make a difference. <laughs>